On the last video, I started building my woodworking shop, aka garage workspace. The first order of business was to buy or build some workbenches. After a little bit of research and some price comparison, I ended up purchasing four of the Harbor Freight 48 inch units. These units are sold on the several SKUs. Those item numbers are 60723, 99681, and 62563. From what I can tell, the only difference between these numbers is the color. The original one was black, then a gray one came along, and as of late, it comes in a dark blue color. As per the website's comment section, this 48 inch workbench with lights and drawers has a lot of haters out there. I think this has to do in part with the less than stellar instructions. I am quite familiar with all sorts of ready to assemble or RTA furniture and even I made several rookie mistakes during the assembly process. It is for this reason I decided to make this video and share with you not only the assembly process, but also some of the modifications I made to make this a better solution for your garage workspace. I guess the first thing we need to address is the tools that we are going to need to assemble this thing. At a bare minimum, you're going to need a number two and a number three Phillips screwdriver along with some pliers. However, I will be using a power drill, a 10 millimeter combination wrench, as well as several spring clamps for efficiency sake. I didn't show it here, but a 10 millimeter nut driver or socket is also a good idea. As with any RTA project, the first thing we need to do is to find an ample and flat space to open the box and take inventory. Most of the time you will be opening the box from the top or from the side. In this instance, you will be opening the box from the back. That is okay since that is where all the heavy wood parts are. Don't fuss too much with the parts or part numbers at this time. Just try to group them by shape. I am not the type to take a strict count of parts or hardware on an RTA project. That is because I rarely follow the directions. When I buy a product like this, I already have an idea of what I want it to be. So in many ways, it is just a building block in my overall project or idea. When using this approach, it is not unusual to have leftover parts or hardware. It is also not unusual for me to have to buy additional parts and or hardware. With that said, know that there are comments on the Harbor Freight website about pieces missing. I don't think they were left out at the factory, so more than likely they fell off during shipping. So, if you find the nylon straps that hold the box together missing, the tape seal broken, or large holes from where things may have fallen out of, you may want to take inventory of everything that is supposed to be in the box. You can find the parts list on page 10 of the instruction manual. Before we proceed to the assembly process, we need to talk about hardware. Hardware are the nuts, screws, and washers that hold this workbench together. In my opinion, one of the weakest links in this product. In the hardware bag, you're going to find three individual sets of screw, washers, and nuts. The larger package is what you would use for just about everything except for the pegboard, which takes longer ones. If you are going to attach or rest anything on top of this workbench that vibrates, such as a vacuum pump, a tumbler, an air compressor, or even a buffer, I strongly recommend that you set aside the flat washers included in the hardware package and opt for something better. For example, you could use Loctite, but keep in mind there's over 100 screws in this kit. Another option are star washers, but they can get a little expensive. I opted for the Shiba alternative, which are pressure washer or split washers as some people call them. A bag of 25 like the ones I use here costs about a buck and they are worth every penny. Okay, so without further ado, let's start assembling. I don't know if I mentioned this before, but I will not be following the instruction manual. Please watch the entire video and it will all make sense at the end. Let's start by choosing one set of legs and making sure that the holes align. These are marked part one and part two. The second thing we need to choose is whether the electrical outlet is on the left or on the right. I want mine's on the left. 
That means when I rest the two legs on top of the table for assembly, the short leg needs to be on my left and the long leg on the right. Proceed to look for one of the short braces labeled part number four and make sure that the lip is facing up. Here is where the clamps become handy and act almost like a second set of hands. With everything somewhat square, it is time to start adding fasteners. You want to put them from the outside in, then the washer, and then the nut, something like this. Be aware that the rear longer legs have three sets of holes and that you want to use the middle ones for the short side braces. The two holes at the top will be used for the top extension and the two below for the drawer later on. With the one side completed, it is time to put on the feet and repeat the process on the next one. Just make sure that you have a mirror and not two rights or two lefts. Alright, now that we have a left and a right, it is time to put the top and bottom supports. This is part number 5 and 6. Number 5 is the bottom, number 6 is the top. The only difference between these two is the extra set of holes that number 6 has in the center. With the frame all together, it is time to put in place the bottom shelf and the workbench deck. And as the title of this video suggests, we are going to be doing some modifications to this Harbor Freight workbench in order to make it a better solution for your garage workspace. Let's start by making a pencil mark on either part number 19 or 20. These are the bench top and the bottom shelf. Make a mark about 15 inches from the end and about 3 eighths of an inch from the edge. We are going to be making 4 additional holes on each of these with a number 8 countersinking bit. Now I know I did not make any mentionings of these additional tools in the intro, but understand that this procedure is 100% optional. Aside from the countersinking bit, we are also going to need some double side tape. Any brand, any type will do, 
but you know that I am biased to 3M. Just make sure it's a foam type. And you probably want it to be between 3 16 of an inch to 1 quarter inch thick. In other words, not too thin, not too thick, and about an inch wide, although 2 inches is even better. When you finish drilling, flip the bore over and cut and stick about half inch pieces along the side of each of the holes. Go ahead and remove the wax paper from the double side tape and put the board in place. We are going to be installing additional screws in the holes we just made. Ideally we want some 3 quarter inch number 8 flathead screws like these. I didn't have any that were long enough so I will be using ordinary 1 inch drywalls. Number 6 drywall screws are about 137 thousandths of an inch in diameter. The only drip bed I have smaller than 1 eighth is a 764 or about 107. I'm hoping that that will do the trick. Another issue with drywalls is that they strip very easy. I have to make sure that my drill's clutch is set very light. Making sure that the metal brace is flush with the wooden board, go ahead and drill through the four holes we previously made. Now making sure that the clutch in your drill is set at no more than one third of what it's capable of, go ahead and put the screws in place. As you can see, the bench is already much stiffer than it was, although we have not put in place the top deck. As far as the top deck is concerned, it's nothing but a repeat of what we just did, so we're just going to fast forward through it. Okay, so now with the deck and the bottom shelf in place, what do we do next? I think we should move on to the drawer guys before moving to the top shelf, although in actuality, I should have done that before putting the deck in place. Don't worry, this is a pretty straightforward procedure and with the help of a couple of spring clamps, it should only take us 2 or 3 minutes. After locating the drawer bridge as I call it, that is the piece with the dual tracks and the two ends, we need to look for two little angle pieces labeled 7F for front and 7B for back. Place them with the short side down into the center of part number 8, the drawer bridge, and assemble it. Note that the front of part 8 is the one with the tracks closest to the edge. Once assembled, grab several clamps and put it into position. The rear bracket goes on the outside and the front bracket goes in the inside of the frame. The installation of 9L for left and 9R for right, the two outer slides, is as straightforward as it can be. Just bolt it in place with the tracks closest to the edge facing forward and you are done. With that completed, let's reposition the camera and start building the top. We'll start with the two upright posts. Know that there is a left and a right for these as well. At this time, it's also a good idea to add the back brace, but make sure to only bolt on the top screws. Don't install the lower ones. With the top frame now in place, we can go ahead and install the pegboard. There is nothing special about this procedure, although I recommend that you start with the lower center screw, do the two top corners, and then proceed to the rest. Also note that in the instruction manual, they have the screws going from back to front. I did not want the screws protruding into my work area, so I installed them front to back. I also used some of the spare flat washers I had left over from the original hardware package to protect the wood. At this point, the workbench is starting to feel pretty solid. Nevertheless, I'm still going to add additional screws and double side tape to the top shelf. 
I just don't want vibrations to cause any rattling. I have no idea what I was thinking or what got into me, but for some reason I decided to rebuild the top shelf on top of the desk. This is not a good idea. Putting up the metal parts and then the wood on top is the way to go. With the structure somewhat completed, we can move on to the final step of the assembly, that being the drawers. I left this for last because it is a lot easier to build this on top of the deck than on the floor or somewhere else. Also note that this is the first project I would have built on top of this workbench. Besides that, after getting to this point, this step may seem like child's play. The procedure is quite simple, since all we are doing is building a box. Go look for part number 11 and 12 as well as 10L and 10R. Get a set of clamps to hold it in place and screw it together. However, when it comes to the drawer handles, I need to ask you, please, please don't use a drill, as I guarantee that you will break them. But other than that, I have no other warnings to give. After I finished assembling my first workbench and I started to admire my work, it was then that I realized a flaw that used to tick me off with the benches I have back in Miami. And that is the small things falling out the back via the gap between the bench and the wall. I guess I could have left it and fixed it later, but I decided to fix it now. That is because I have a spare sheet of half inch MDF I have purchased as deck for my workhorse. Since I am building four of these benches, I ripped the sheet into four 6 inch panels. Be aware that the length also has to be trimmed at about 47 and 1 8. I would have preferred to use 3 quarter inch MDF, but this is what I had on hand. And with 99% of this assembly complete, I was not going to stop to go look for wood. If you don't have a circular saw or means to cut this piece, 98% of all big box stores are willing to cut it for you at no additional cost. Also know that if you go to Home Depot in particular, they have pre-cut 3 quarter inch by 12 by 48 pieces that are much better suited for this modification. All you will have to do is have them trim the length. As far as the installation goes, we're going to start by finding center since we're going to be adding a reinforcement bracket. After securing the board with clamps, I went ahead and drilled the two legs and I then used a comb bit to make sure the flathead screws end up being flush with the board. Although not required, I chose to use double side tape here as well. This will keep rattling and resonance down to a minimum. As for fasteners, I once again opted for what I had on hand some 832 by 3 quarter inch flatheads. Not my first choice, but it's what I have so it will have to do. I should have used quarter inch screws. As for vertical support, I chose to use some flat galvanized plates used to reinforce the corners when you're building a shed. They cost about 65 cents and although thin, they are quite strong. Actually, quite stronger than the material the bench is made out of. 
When drilling the two top screws for center support, I realized there was a small gap on the bottom of the board. I used a clamp to make sure we had a better fit. Okay, so taking into consideration how long this video has dragged, you're probably asking yourself, are we done? Unfortunately, no. We had to drive down to Miami for a few days just after I finished filming the video. And when I got back, I ran into this. It rained quite a bit the weekend we were gone and it looks like humidity had its way with the pegboard. To fix it, I opted for two more galvanized plates and fixed them halfway between the center support and the end post. While doing this, I also realized the center bracket had a lot of play, so I decided to add a screw there as well. As far as screws are concerned, I use a number six by one inch uh, sheet metal type uh, pan head to drill onto the top deck. And as for the pegboard, I use some 832 by half inch with a split washer and nut. Yeah, maybe not the best choice, and, but it is what I have on hand and it will have to do for now. Hey guys, thank you for sticking with me until the end. I know that video dragged a little bit, even with time lapse, it's uh, 25 minutes or so. Uh, there was just a lot of material to cover and I wanted to be as detailed as possible. Uh, even with that, I feel that I left a little things here and there I would have done difference, but nevertheless, one thing about my channel, it is that you're not, I'm not gonna get caught in this five minute crazy, you know, mentality that all YouTube videos have to be five minutes and two minutes or whatever. All right, there's a story to be told, man. And if the story takes five minutes, awesome. If it takes 50, it is what it is. With that said, I hope you enjoyed the video and I will greatly appreciate it if you subscribe, share, and like. I am trying to grow this channel and I can't do it without you. I have a lot of material coming your way. We're doing a lot of stuff, not only here in the garage, but also inside the house. I got painting to do. Uh, we're building a surround sound system. We're gonna build all the speakers, the surround, the subwoofer, the center channel, uh, and so on. So uh, if this type of material is what you like to do or watch, uh, please follow. I will greatly appreciate it. One more thing I want to address is the light. Uh, I know a lot of people are gonna be questioning, hey, what happened to the light? Uh, well. The truth is I never had any intentions in using it. Uh, there are some reasons for that, but if you want to use the light, and this, this it comes with a kit, uh, it's not a bad little light, don't get me wrong, okay? It's just that you have to understand what this channel is about and what I'm going to be doing here. I'm going to be making uh, hunting decoys, I'm going to be making fishing lures, I'm going to be doing a lot of DIY projects where we need, I need details. Uh, you have no idea how many times I have painted a lure or, or poured some uh, soft plastics and um, take them outside and they look completely different than they look inside the garage. And that has to do with the lighting frequency. Uh, so to put the light in place is very simple. You're going to screw these two little brackets onto the top shelf. There are two small plastic plugs that they go into and then just snap the light into place. Uh, the plug is detachable and can be used on the left and the right, depending on what your electricity is. There's a hole here and a hole on the other side. Uh, so make the installation very, very neat and, and, and kind of out of the way. Uh, with that said, uh, my biggest beef for the light is that uh, it is a fluorescent bulb. And although it has a shield, which is always a good thing in a workshop, uh, it is still a fluorescent bulb. That means that that bulb, this bulb is going to go bad in about 1500 hours. Uh, at the number of hours that I spent here in the garage, probably a year, maybe less. Uh, if I forget them to, if I forget to turn them off, they're going to be off, you know, they're going to be on all night. Uh, so the life of the bulb then, because it is a fluorescent bulb, it has a ballast. That ballast will last you 25 to 3,000 hours, normally two bulbs. Uh, you normally have to replace it on the second bulb on this little ones. The commercial ones are a different story, but the little ones don't last too long. 
Um, aside from that, we have to deal with light frequency. Now, most, you know, there's always an exception to the rules, but most fluorescent bulbs are 2800 to, I don't know, 32, 3400. Uh, K uh, and light and that is kind of like a yellowish light that will distort the colors uh, some colors uh, depending on the, because it's the low frequency uh, it will distort some colors for the type of work that I do and for most working environment I recommend something around uh, I don't know 4500 or so 5,000 is okay, it starts to get a little bluish and then you start running with the same problem if you go really blue, if you go really high. 55, 6,000 K, uh, it looks very bright, but it will distort the colors. Uh, so aside from that, it's not a bad little light. Uh, something else, it is, this is a T5 14 watt bulb uh, and it puts out maybe 300 luminance or so. I can replace that with a three watt LED 500 luminance, you know, 5K for, I don't know, for like three, four dollars. Uh, in fact, I have some orders. It's just that with this quarantine thing, everything is taking forever to get here. But uh, nevertheless, you know, it's not a bad little light. It's all relevant to what type of work you're going to be doing with a workbench. And uh, it definitely, if you're going to be doing jewelry or something that you want to see details, this is not it. Uh, when I bought the bench, I had bought these big ones from um, Harbor Freight. Uh, they're 47 inches and they fit right underneath the shelf. However, these things are 5,000 luminance and uh, they are just blind. You know, uh, there's a there's a thing about not having enough light and that's just too much light. Uh, probably what I end up doing it is. Uh, so as you can tell, the lighting in this garage is like eh. So i uh, probably mount them in the ceiling, but I have to run some wiring and stuff. And uh, I don't know, maybe I'll make it a project. So we got one bench uh, put together. We got three more to do. I guess I'll see you in the next build. For those inquisitive minds that want to know exactly which light I ended up using on the workbench, here it is. I purchased them on eBay. Uh, they cost about $4. They are uh, 6 watt and not 3 watts, as I previously mentioned. They are 500 luminance, 5K. And one thing that I like about them is that they are low voltage. So uh, what I will be doing is clipping the low voltage side of the power cable and inserting a switch so that I can control each bench individually. I will do my best in a future video to incorporate a review, what they look like, how they perform, so on and so on. So please stay tuned. Support this channel by subscribing, liking, and sharing. And don't forget to hit that notification bell. That allows our videos to show up in your timeline. Thank you.